Welcome to Free Media, Free Minds. Free Media, Free Minds is a program that explores media freedom, diversity, and access to information. My name is Pumezam Tegazi. And I'm Helga Janssen Daubia. Welcome to our show. Thank you for joining us. In our show today, we talk about the Bill of Rights in South Africa. The Bill of Rights guarantees that you and I have freedom of expression and most importantly, freedom of, art of artistic expression. This democratic right did not exist prior to 1994. The restrictions on the media and restrictions on artistic expression have been lifted, or have they? In our program today, we explore freedom of expression and question the agenda of censorship as we see increasing and control in media and the arts. Joining us in studio today, we have a cartoonist, Zapiro. Welcome. Thank you. And next to him, we have Dr. Ndrovu, who is a media senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town. Welcome, Mr. And next to him, we have Kolani Zuda, who is a rapper and poet. Welcome. Thank you. If you've just joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. Before we talk, we're going to have a very exciting conversation. Let's look at a clip from ZA News, the political satire show currently online. A row is brewing between Cape Town City Council and the South African National Parks Board about the millions of rands the Table Mountain Reserve generates every year. The City Council owns most of the land, but it is managed by Sun Parks, which has introduced a new activity fee. Hold that, hold that. That will be 120 rand, please. What on earth for? Activity fee. That's an accident, eh? Yeah, it's a bad fall, I'm afraid. Is she still breathing? Fortunately. Then that'll be 120 rand, please. You have to be joking. What for? Activity fee. But I've got a wild card. <sighs> Sorry, I just expired. You've just watched a clip um, about freedom of expression. And Dr. Ndlovo, um, during the apartheid, freedom of expression was restricted. And how important is freedom of expression in our democracy? It's very important, if I can put it just in short. Um, the assumption is that any society matures as you have different voices from different people and your different ways of looking at things. If you restrict that, a society does not grow. And sometimes different perspectives can get bottled up and they explode into violence. But the more people express themselves as freely as they can, that's when the society matures and that's when people can get to understand each other far much better. So. What you're saying is that uh, artistic expression is a way of us finding common ground. But Jonathan, I want to ask you, you've, as a Piro, you've taken us through, through your work, 20 years of democracy. And I, I, I think that, you know, I speak for many, many of our viewers and we say we are incredibly proud of the work that you've done. Yet, in the last while, you've suffered, your, your work has come under fire. Why is this? Well, it came under fire in the apartheid era, and then I had a kind of a, I had a period in which it appeared that I was sort of a little bit more in concert with where the ANC was going, um, and that was not, I think, because I changed my politics. My pol I was always a, I was a member of the United Democratic Front. I was a member of the ANC, but I was less involved. I was, I was very much a, a UDF activist and, and an, act, an activist cartoonist. And I think that I experienced uh, banning of, my, of, of certain works that, that I did then and also of the newspapers that, that I was... Uh, uh, that I was working for. So you're for. no stranger to banning. Yeah, and, <laughs> so, and I, I completely agree with, uh, with Musa. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's hugely important that we actually have the constitutional protections and that things opened up. And we've had a, a, a period of immense freedom 
as satirists, as, as cartoonists, as stand-up comedians, as all, 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 for, all forms of, ex, of, of expression, artistic expression, have been... So why are you out of favor now? And, well, and it's, not just, it's certainly not just me. I think what's happened now is that over the past few years, one has, we've seen that as the ANC has not delivered everything that they said they were going to deliver or that, uh, that, they, that they wanted to, as certain people have become corrupt, certain people have become inefficient, whatever it is, uh, and as the ANC has been criticized more, they have started lashing out at their critics, including satirists of all kinds. And I'm one of those, and I've, I've criticized very harshly. So, if I can just say, I mean, tongue-in-cheek, the fact that, you, um, that your work is being challenged is, means that you're working. <laughs> you do, I mean, if you look at it that way, I suppose so. I mean, you could say that you, you could say that uh, if you're a satirist, uh, well, let's say you're a cartoonist or a stand-up comedian, all you're looking for is is belly laughs. You're probably not doing nearly as much as you could be in this genre because the genre is about taking things to 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 places that are difficult and uncomfortable. And as a cartoonist, definitely that's what I have been doing with politicians, with religious groups, with, with, all, with, even with the public, you know, pushing the public when the public seems to be reactionary in yeah. terms of things like the death penalty or, or corporal rape. punishment or, or, or rape or whatever. You know, you, yeah. you, you're criticizing, you're throwing barbs yes. and the barbs yeah. are not, and everyone's got a different standard as to what, what mm. is crossing the line. Now, Polani, for you, what does hmm. freedom of expression mean? Um, I guess freedom of expression is just like it's that it's exactly that like you it's where you have a platform to actually say whatever you feel and it just so happens that we live in a society that in the majority of whatever we feel is um the feeling of being disconcerted with what we are getting from our government Ix, you know? i want to ask you you were at the university of cape town and you're yes. a spoken word poet and a rapper yes as the university have you experienced any censorship from the university because of the kind of expression that, that the way that you express your thoughts well the one at the university is actually quite different well specifically at UCT <coughs> because you you're not getting it from um, the academic departments mm -hmm. um, so to speak but you get it from like the students themselves it's, it seems like we live in this vacuum where we are expected to say certain things and some other things we can't say like recently what um, can't you say I guess I don't know um, definitely things that relate to race not that you can't say it, but there's a way in which you are expected to speak about it. And How say, are you expected to speak about it? I think it's very interesting because we don't talk enough about race, mm, you mm. know. So what, what is the universe, how would the university like you to express issues okay, around race? Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me mention this because this is like I feel is a two-sided coin. Recently, there was a girl, um, Caucasian girl, who did like a study on like the most attractive races on campus, you know. And when the results came out, it, it came out that, okay, the, the Caucasians were the most attractive. And people started lashing out, like, um, what about the black people? You know, what about the Indians and stuff? Like, your study is so biased and stuff. And who did you consult? Because we didn't know about this. Dr. Moussa, I want to bring you in here. <laughs> um, the study was very controversial, if we remember, um, especially if you live in the Cape Town area. But wouldn't you say that the fact that people had the freedom to lash out means that our legislation is working? The fact that there was an environment in which people could speak out about it. First of all, I was not here okay. when that <laughs> happened. I was. Um, secondly, the legislation is working. But the issue is that in a democracy, censorship is very difficult to detect. It's very subtle. It's unlike in a full-blown dictatorship. Mm -hmm. It comes in a, in a particular way of power and of silencing, of allowing certain voices and not allowing certain mm. voices. And it might not necessarily come from government, mm. but in, in, it can come in a, in a particular kind of an environment. I'm not talking here about this particular issue, yeah. but it's just that in general, in a democracy, censorship can be very subtle. So Jonathan, Zabiro, I want to bring you in here. The subtlety, isn't this dangerous? Isn't it more dangerous than having it in your face? And you've had experience of the subtleties, the digging, the... I, I find it difficult to answer that question. It's a very interesting one. I don't, I've never actually thought about whether it's more dangerous or not. I, I think it's different, and I'm, I'm not really sure how to, to say whether it's more dangerous or not. 
Uh, no, I do think real censorship is incredibly dangerous. The, the, the subtle censorship is, is something that has to, be, has to be dealt with. I mean, I think the I subtlety think comes from both, from both ends. Yeah. Uh, here, here's a case in point. Um, so you get subtle censorship in terms of sort of corporate censorship. You've seen what happened with things like FNB. FNB gets criticized. Then the next thing, you get not only FNB, but other people scared to do what if it, so there's, it becomes self-censorship, and that's, that's very dangerous. So that, that I do think is dangerous. As an artist, have you ever been in a position where you've thought, oh, maybe I have gone over the line? And if, if, if our viewers remember, there was a lot of um, uproar about the, your, your depictions of rape and justice in a cartoon a couple of months ago. So at, at that point, did you ever feel that maybe I've stepped over a model line? I have sometimes felt I've stepped over the line but not with those cartoons that, that, that became such big issues. Well, maybe with one of them. Uh, I think one of them was a little ill-advised and I've apologized for that. I've apologized not for going beyond my, the realms of, the, of what I should in freedom of expression, but just it, it was probably a bit of a silly exercise. But not for the, the, the Lady Justice cartoon, I stand by that cartoon completely. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the issues were really important. It was metaphorical. Uh, the, the, you know, Jacob Zuma sued me for a period of four years over that. Uh, Seven million and then it was five million and then eventually they dropped the case before Mangaung because they knew we would trounce them in court. They really realized that. Mac Maharaj then tried okay. to spin it. Please hold the yeah. thought. Hold, just there, <laughs> just there. When we get back from the ad break, you will continue our discussion. Um, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds, and we're going to take a short break. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Free Media, Free Minds, the show where we talk all things media. I wish you'd been with us during our break because we had some exciting conversations. But Jonathan, continue your, your thought before the break. You spoke about censorship. Yeah, I was saying that perhaps there's a, there, there was a cartoon I did with a limerick and a little, a little dick drawing, which, which, <laughs> which I have apologized for, not because I overstepped freedom of expression, but because I, I think people didn't understand, the cartoon wasn't as nuanced as some of the other ones. I still stand by the criticism, but perhaps I accept that, you know, you can't do the right stuff every time. I'm doing hundreds of cartoons. But the, the things like the Lady Justice cartoon, The Rape of Justice, and other cartoons where I've, where I've been involved in big media furores, I have de I've defended those and I'll continue to defend them and I've had the backing of my newspapers, of freedom of expression organizations like the Freedom of Expression Institute, uh, International Publishers Association, and, and, and I really think that in a, in, in a society like ours, I mean, cartooning has been described as the litmus test for democracy. It's not just cartooning, it's about satire, it's about yeah, other forms yeah. of criticism, but, it's a, but it is a, a good test of how well a, a democracy uh, uh, approaches its critics. Talking about apologizing, are you always expected to apologize when someone's not happy with you drawing something? Somebody's always expecting us to apologize or me to apologize and in fact it's happening right now. I mean in fact just this week I've been told that I, if I do not apologize for a cartoon I did on uh, about Indian cricket and, and South African cricket, include, which we used the god Ganesha, the Indian, yes. the Hindu yes. god Ganesh, as, or Lord Ganesha, as, as a metaphor for the Indian, the bullying Indian yeah, cricket yeah. board with money, which apparently caused some, some uh, offense with some people. Now, not only Hindu groups, but even some other religious groups are saying the Sunday Times and I have to so apologize. Apolog They've given us an ultimatum, and we can't apologize, or apologize. on principle. We, we stand by the cartoon. I want to come to this thing about apologizing, Dr. Moussa. And uh, X, you can come in here as well. Um, in the break, we were talking about certain corporations 
uh, and we're going to say Nando's, who we know have been at the forefront of the satirical campaigns, chicken and social issues. And you know, we've all laughed, we've all gone to the YouTube clips, we've all watched TV. But would you agree that in, in recent times, Nando's gone a bit soft? And maybe soft flowing from the, 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 the whole F&B debacle, and if our viewers at home remember, um, First National Bank was almost forced to apologize or withdraw an ad in which young people were seen to be criticizing the government. Do you think they've gone soft? Have they been scared? I don't, well, there are two things. One is that they could have gone choice, but it would be a soft, but it would, it would have been out of choice. It would be difficult to establish a relationship between Nando's and government unless they supply a lot of chicken to um, <laughs> government departments. It, it should be different with FNB, where they could have some of the business with government. If Nando's has gone soft, it could be a strategic choice or it could be because they have a, some kind of a backlash with the public, so, not necessarily with the government. Okay. Jack, Musa, very is that the subtlety that you're talking about? That if we have to make a strategic business decision between our relationship with government and, and running a piece of satirical ad campaign, we choose the relationship. Is that the subtlety? I, 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 that's not what I was talking about. The, the subtlety will impact on FNB in the era of business. When somebody does not necessarily, when the legislation does not exist that says you cannot do this or that, but we can withhold business from you, or we can throw in a race card, okay. or we can use a certain kind of power to make sure that you do not become very harsh in the criticism of us or people associated with us. It would be very difficult to establish that yeah. with Nando's, given the differences between the two businesses. Well, Lani, you wanted to come in here. Um, yeah, like I'll just speak on Nando's. Like I personally feel like at the end of the day, their target is to sell chicken, you understand? <laughs> and they chose, they chose an angle, a daring angle, you know, because, I mean, you've never seen McDonald's do such, such things or KFC and things like that. So for Nando's, it works up to a certain point because these are societal issues. Like I remember they did this Kotani one. This Kotani one is funny. It's funny as hell because we all, like we, we all in consensus with the fact that this Kotani idea is just stupid and mm -hmm. irrelevant, you understand? But now it also taps, like that strategy also taps into other issues that may be sensitive, um, not just the youth, but also like the parents and then they, like you get that uproar. Mm -hmm. So my answer with your question that has it gone soft, um, I would say probably yes, but under the strategy that they're trying to maintain their credibility. Jonathan, I want to ask you, do we have, we've, we've, we've spoken about your work, you've had experience at UCT, Dr. Mm. Moss has given us a kind of an overview. Mm. Do we have, despite the legislation, do we have censorship in this country? Um, we have, I, I think, I think the, the, the subtle censorship or, or self-censorship the, those those issues are, are there, and they're they're there in every democracy. The kind of corporate, uh, you know, corporate nervousness when you see noises happening at the top is is something one has to watch for. And I think that's what we've seen increasingly over the past few years. We've also seen clampdowns in other aspects of freedom of information and and uh, freedom of the right to criticize. But it hasn't been in the form of legislation yet. I'll tell you what worries me is that the noises from the top, both in terms of information and in criticism, are not good. You know, when you have the secrecy bill uh, being pushed through and, and, and having to be altered as much as possible by, 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 by civil society and opposition groups and a few, a few isolated people in the ANC on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have people like, like Blade and Zimande actually seriously proposing a law that protects the president from insults, whatever those are. That kind of dignity law, which happens across many countries in Africa, and not only in Africa, but in other parts of the world as well, that kind of thing is what we have not had in the last 20 years. We have had, as I said at the beginning, a very, very free terrain. The problem is that there are, there are increasingly strident voices within very powerful sectors of society 
who don't like the criticism and who are finding ways to put pressure without legislation, without the, the actual force of law, but they, they're trying, finding ways to put pressure and they want ultimately to bring in new laws. So that is, that's what we've got to fight. Um, Pumiza, do you think that in your, I mean, you know, we're all out there in the world, you also, you come from the creative industries. Mm -hmm. Have you felt um, any kind of, of pressure to, 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 to censor the kind of work? And our viewers who don't know, Pumiza is a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, in arts, there are a lot of politics within arts. So um, I guess sometimes you need to be aware of what you need to be to be aware of other cultures, and you, you need to you need to you need to know what not to put in front of people's eyes. Okay, then in that I, I mean, like in terms of performing arts, yes. in, like in performing yeah. arts on stage. You can't be naked on stage, isn't so you need to be aware. But isn't that just an example of the self-censorship? <laughs> I, I, yeah. uh, I, I think yeah. it is. I think it is. Censorship is mainly around the issues of sex, issues of mm -hmm. violence and issues. Um, I think one of the things that artists have to do is really sometimes push boundaries. Mm -hmm. If they are going to play it safe all the time, we may not go. And we, we are here. <laughs> as humans because people have pushed boundaries. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what, what, what Zapiro was talking about um, during the break, that there's a sense of, there, there's gratuity that we all do not like. Yeah. But there is also the kind of performances that we, we can't be tame all the time. Um, I feel like as much as we have the power of expression and we can call out a lot of things that people don't normally talk about in public spaces, at the same time we have to consider that there's different cultures, different personalities. And I'm not saying we're trying to favor these people, but I'm trying to say we really need to look at ways in which we, we, we share this information. Some, some of the people, when they express themselves, they do not consider that some, like a lot of us need to be lowered into a topic, you understand? We need to be properly introduced into a topic. You can't just go in the street right now and say, I'm fighting for um, like the, the, the rights of women, let me go naked. Like, that that is like it it's not properly administered and you may find that just down the street there's there's a, a huge pervert who's looking at you and then it turns into a different thing you Doug know Wasa, i see you shaking your head here knowingly you want to no, come uh, in here uh, uh, all artworks exist in context it's cultural political economic etc um th there has been with uh, respect to Polani, um people who have expressed certain views with respect to uh, women, but, and they have gone naked internationally mm. uh, to express that. And, what is um, the name of that group? Fem um, yeah, there's a whole group of, of feminists in Europe who protest by bearing their breasts. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I think sometimes, given the nature of the violence, and mm. to make sure that people actually listen, uh, people will have to go to that extreme um, I don't think they would necessarily go that far had we been listening in the first place. I think the, the, the changes in the way that people protest mm. is because they have put on the first message, we did not listen, the second one, to the point where they but have to go naked. I want to just ask, going naked, yes. I mean, we have a... I'm not saying we, it's we, right. We, we, have some <laughs> yeah, we, we have some moral, I mean, we have some serious moral issues in our country. Yes. Jonathan, in the break we were talking about the, how um, our, our, our sense of morality and what's right and wrong in our context doesn't always um, gel with our leaders and the kinds of actions that they uh, perpetrate in our society. Maybe you want to talk more about that? And, and, and case in point, um, Zwillin Zima Vavi, uh, a champion of the poor, a champion of workers, and yet uh, some questionable issues around his, you know, his, his, his personal life. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the case of Zwillin Zima Vavi is a very difficult one, and it's quite a painful one. I mean, somebody who a lot of people respect and, and, and are, a lot of people, like myself, are hoping that he can push things in a, in a different direction. And uh, when he fell from grace in the way that he did, 
because it was an issue of whether he abused his power with the, the, getting this person into the position, and then it was at work, and then there was a coercive, and all of those kind of things. That becomes problematic in terms of ethical things. At, at the same time, people are then able to exploit that and use that and make a, a political campaign against him. And how does the media help that political campaign? In, um, that, in the making of that political campaign? Look, I think that I, I don't think it was so much the media doing that as the, as, as the forces hell bent against his, uh, the power that he has within the, within the unions. I mean, I think it was within the tripartite alliance that it was his, it was those, it was, it was the, the, the opposing forces, the Zuma camp, really, that, that, that exploited that as much as possible. That's, that's as, as the bottom line, Lamini and Co., but the Zuma camp. <laughs> so it, it, I think that's what happened. But with Jacob Zuma himself, which is a hugely important issue, it's, you know, people say, well, he's entitled to express himself as a sexual being and, 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 and his own, uh, he's entitled to have his identity as an African traditionalist. And sure. The question is, is he entitled to be hypocritical as president when he makes a very good HIV AIDS speech on World AIDS Day and then shortly afterwards one finds that he's been breaking every single rule and guideline that he set there, he's been setting the wrong example to, to the youth and to the rest of the country, he's basically been lying. So th that is the kind of abuse that I'm talking about. Also the abuse of power, the power dynamics that he has you know, outside of his, his marriages, he has these marriages and then, he, then he's with young women yeah. who, who are much younger than him. And, and so he abu it's about abuse of power, it's about hypocrisy. Those are the kinds of things that I think people do need yeah. to be held accountable and for. And it's absolutely the kind of things, before we go to you, Dr. Moussa, it's absolutely the kind of things that um, satirists, cartoonists and the artists in our society have every right to reflect. Yeah. I, I think satirists and, and, and artists... Um, they have to educate the, the public about this thing. But I want to go back to the issue of um, that, that Zapira was talking about. Th this is not necessarily a, a traditional leadership. We do not inherit leaders. People campaign, they tell us we should vote for them because they are clean, yeah. because they have integrity. Yeah. And that's what we expect. Yes. And then if they deviate from that, then artists and satirists have to expose them for the hypocrisy that's there. I want yeah. to just ask each of you um, concluding thoughts. We have to wrap up now. Your concluding thoughts on the role that artists and that cartoonists and satirists have to play um, in our society. Um, well, like um, he has said, like we have a, like a very important responsibility because people look up to us. Um, people listen to us because we decide to share information in this different way. It's not a, a conversation as me and you are talking, but we decide to put rhythm to it or we draw it. And then I think we owe it to ourselves to stay true to that responsibility and never abuse it for like our own pleasures or to please a certain kind of group because once you do that, you, you compromise in the art. I think the society, uh, South Africans sometimes undermine their democracy. They have to protect the artist and satirist. Mm -hmm. You don't want a society where people are unable to speak, anyone for that matter. Freedom of expression is everything and anything. Yeah. I'd like to continue those thoughts and say, yes, very much so. It's, it's not, not as if we have any more rights than anybody else to, as satirists, if you call yourself a satirist, you call yourself a, a stand-up comedian, a, a spoken artist, or a, a writer, a, a cartoonist, a, a whatever it is, it's not, as, it's not as if we have any more rights than anyone. Everybody can use these rights. Everybody can express themselves, and we must protect that right for everybody, not just for people who call themselves satirists. It's an incredibly important part of, of any democracy that really is a democracy and, and we have that freedom at the moment we are seeing forces that are fighting against those freedoms and we must keep on doing what we do I want to say thank you to all our guests for a truly invigorating conversation um, and to leave you with a thought that our last guest has just said, has just spoken about we must protect the artists in our society, not because they only need the protection as individuals but because they help, they help to protect our democracy. You've been watching Free Minds, Free Media. I'm Helga Janssen Daubia. And I am Pumazam Tegazi. Till we see you next time on Free Media, Free Minds. I am ready. We are here. Open, open, open.